So Jerry, my first question is for you. We know that hindsight is, this is of course 2020, um, but what are some of the things that, uh, that you appreciate that your parents or some of the first responders did when uh, your accident occurred? Well, yeah, I appreciate, uh, uh, well, uh, Tracy mentioned that uh, when you come across something like this, that the job of the person who discovers the victim, their job is to wait until rescue comes. Uh, because of our first responder system, one of our neighbors was one of the first people over and he was a neighbor farmer and he said to dad, I can go down there, I can get him. And dad, uh, for what it's worth said, no, one man down there is enough. And he was right. That's absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, we've heard many stories like Tracy related of a, of a person going down into a manure pit and another to rescue them and another and you just create multiple funerals. So I really appreciate that. And then I uh, uh, appreciate the, the speed with which the uh, first responders came. Uh, they're all neighbors, they're people that knew me and uh, I'm sure they worked very extra hard to try to save my life. And of course I can never repay my wife for uh, a couple of different times she stood up for me and, and requested that the medical personnel take the next step when they were ready to give up. Um, we never know how these things are going to turn out and since my accident I've been approached by several people who have uh, experienced something similar in their family and uh, they relate how tragic it is and how preventable it is uh, simply by following some of the safety protocols that Tracy outlined, uh, ventilation, having somebody else be there to help you and, and all those things and uh, I think this is totally preventable and we should do everything we can to stop this kind of thing from happening. Well, again, we don't have this opportunity to have a survivor share that story, so we very much appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Leslie, or not Leslie, I'm sorry, Tracy. Um, a couple of questions came up regarding farm safety checklists on the farm. Uh, what's, your, what's been your approach as an extension specialist in, in sharing those checklists and, and using those checklists and how to incorporate those checklists into you know, our, our regular training system? Yes, and, and I think they're very important. They provide us with a guide of things that we should be thinking about in our operations. Um, I do have listed in the resources there as far as uh, available, and I know it's the last slide and we didn't put that one up, but you'll make those available to the, to the personnel that um, UMESH has an excellent uh, manure safety checklist that you can go through in your operations. And just to make sure that, you know, because sometimes there's things, you know, we think we got all our bases covered and they do a really nice job of um, reminding us of some of the, the protocols we need to think about and have in place. So I would definitely be in favor of using them and encourage you to seek out the, the resource there at UMASH and there are others I see coming in on the um, discussion here that are also very good resources. Um, Tracy, and a couple of questions have come in about um, training in, in Spanish or in other languages. What are some resources that, um, that you can point to for um, okay. protocols of signage in, in other languages? Sure, and I know through the National Farm Program, Farmers Assuring Responsible Management, and I've seen Tim Rosh was on, on the list and participating today, and he's one of the, the evaluators in that, but they have some great Spanish resources available up on their website. I said, I know UMASH also does and has some bilingual resources up there. And so those are some of them, and there are a lot others out there, and I think we've seen a few of them shared there too, um, and we're starting to see more and more. Um, personally, I, you know, I'm, it's fortunate I have a coworker here in South Dakota. We go through and, and try and, and help producers with some personalization of, of their signage just to make sure that it's meeting the needs that, that they do. So don't be afraid to reach out to your ext extension personnel. There's several um, across the United States who are able to help with that. Um, and, and go across borders if you want. And um, if you're wondering, hey, is this sign or that I'm putting together conveying the message that I need to, um, that's very important. And the other thing I might point out um, as we go through this and, and need to mention too, and we talk about signage, oftentimes when, when we develop signs, we need to not only have, have verbiage, but we also need to include appropriate pictures 
especially um, when we're dealing with English as a second language, that uh, helps to convey that message. And as I mentioned too, with the colors also, that's very important and will help um, stress the importance of having uh, the alertness of the employees to the situation at hand. My next question is for both of you, and it, it's combining a couple of questions that have come in. And it's, you know, as far as um, new technologies or, or new efforts to help with the safety messaging, um, one, one gentleman asked, have you heard of any efforts to develop a warning system like a diver down flag to show when farmers are entering confined spaces? Or are there GPS activated or, or connected gas monitors that that can help with some of this coordination or safety efforts as well. Um, so if you heard of any in, in the programming that you've done or Jerry with your out and abouts in the dairy industry, what are some, what are some things that you've seen that are intriguing? Well, from my end, I've, uh, yeah, I've, those are all interesting ideas doing that. And I'm sure it could be done with uh, modern technology, but uh, most of what I run into is uh, dairy farmers still saying, well, yeah, we had to send a guy in there, but we ran the fan a whole bunch first. And uh, well, it was better than nothing, but still uh, pretty risky uh, business, I think, to send some a human being out into a manure pit. And uh, I tell people too that these gas sensors are available and they're, they're fairly reasonable and certainly worth uh, the cost of a human life. Thanks, Jerry. Anything to add, Tracy? Yeah, and I'm gonna follow up with that and he makes a super point there. You know, um, at the end of the day, in emergency management personnel, we all want to go home to our families. And I have a husband who's, who's a volunteer fireman and, and have provided a lot of different trainings to EMS personnel with some coworkers, and, and that is expressed a lot. But the thing is, we have to make safety a priority. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. A lot of times in our operations, it's there's a lot of hustle and bustle day in and day out. And we just absolutely, as an agricultural community in general, you know, technology is awesome, okay? Don't get me wrong. And it's there to help and aid us. But first, we have to use it and we have to make it a priority. And until that starts happening, you can have all the technology in the world. But you know, like I said, you still got to use it. And, you know, I think it's a great idea. I've not seen a lot as far as specifics on, you know, like if, if somebody would go down, um, and I'm sure there's going to be more and more out there as we come, but one of the considerations, um, I know with the sensors and things like that, it has to be, have the ability to be non-explosive. And so when they're transmitting those signals and whatnot, um, that needs to be taken into consideration. And so those are some things I'm sure the industry as we go forth, you know, and look through those monitors and whatnot in place. And the other thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, technology needs to be affordable if it's going to be purchased and utilized and also be made um, to be not so complicated, usable, user friendly. Very good points. Thank you both. Um, Tracy, you brought up some statistics at the beginning of your presentation. Um, question has come in, any statistics on the percentage of fatal accidents attributed to lack or failure to follow appropriate safety measures or protocols? You know, farming, uh, it's difficult to get a lot of farming data, as many of us know. Um, the, the few that I've found here, you know, is that, um, you know, like I said, about 150 of them, 25% are involving a young person under the age of 16. Um, typically, 34% they're estimating um, those accidents are occurring um, to people that are performing maintenance on equipment. You know, so those are some of the, the statistics. And like, I, you know, I mentioned 22% of the deaths happen um, involving a second person going in to perform or trying to rescue another person. So as we keep looking to it, I, I keep hoping with technology and data gathering that we will get a better handle across this industry on farm accidents and the type of accidents occurring and have a more centrally located place to find this data because it is extremely difficult to get good and accurate data out there. Um, 
on farming accidents and the types of accidents that are occurring. Thank you. Um, a comment was made and, and appreciate your thoughts. Uh, personal protection equipment was, was listed and it's the bottom part of that triangle you presented, Tracy. Mm -hmm. That alone won't meet safety requirements or your safety plan. Um, so can you discuss personal protective equipment in, in light of all those other things? You know, where does that fit into the planning process? Well, where it fits in is we need to make sure one, and I see this happening too often in our operations. Um, you know, obviously removing that hazard is at the top. We want to make sure, you know, with our ventilation, which is the safeguards and the warning signage that we got there and creating that awareness and trying to simply eliminate that that hazard is present is our main priority. And then following that up then, you know, after we talked about our safeguards and our warnings, but with the training um, that people understand it. But the priority is with that personal protective equipment there that people understand how to use it that they have access to it. And that's probably the biggest thing, that they have access to that personal protective equipment and know where it's at. And then, you know, along with that, leading by example. Um, too many times in operations, we see people out there um, preaching about, oh, you gotta have your safety vest on, but yet the owners aren't wearing them themselves. You know, the proper eye protection and the owners aren't wearing it, you know. One, you got to make it available, and two, you got to be the example and have that lead as far as that personal protective equipment. And three, people need to know how to utilize it and utilize it properly. Great points, thank you. Another question, and I think this is a this is a good question here: Is there a, a national regulatory body to assist farmers with their minimum safety requirements, and what role does OSHA play in farm safety? <laughs> well, you know, OSHA tends to be the overarching um, agency that we look to for a lot of these regulations and OSHA regulations come into play in operations when they have 10 or more employees on an operation. And so, you know, and I've and I seen some stuff on the confined spaces and yes, those regulations will also come into play and those guidelines there um, as far as what needs to be in place. So, you know, looking to that as far as OSHA on the safety side is probably our lead agency when we talk about um, manure handling and manure safety with employees in confined spaces. Thank you. Um, Jerry, you touched on this a little bit, but um, I guess when you, when you share your story and you talk about manure safety, either with your your readers or with others that you're dealing with, I guess. How do you approach that messaging and what's what are the what are the steps that you leave people with? Yeah, I tell them to uh, learn from my bad example. Uh, this is what you should not do is the, the things that I did. I did everything exactly wrong on that particular day. I agitated the manure a little before I entered the pit, which, mm -hmm. as you know, causes the hydrogen sulfide to uh, mm -hmm. come out of solution and burp out of the manure. And it was a dead still day, so there was no natural or artificial ventilation at all going on. Uh, and like you said, the weather was hot, and so the bacteria was really, really active, uh, really producing a lot of gas. And I was alone. There was nobody there to uh, help me, and I'm just lucky my dad decided to go down to the barn and check on things and uh, found me there in time. Uh, so that's what I try to stress to people. Don't do the stupid things that I did. Be a little smart about it. Do some ventilation. Use a gas detector. Have a, somebody up there with a rope around the person going down. There are a lot of things that I did wrong, and uh, please don't copy my example. I appreciate you sharing that. We, I think we've covered the majority of questions that have come up in the Q&A, and I appreciate those questions. Uh, we'll stay on the line for a little bit longer, but otherwise, let me take this opportunity to once again thank Jerry and Tracy for um, um, they're stirring presentations today. I know it takes a lot to share those personal stories and, and we do appreciate it. But at the same time, what can we learn from them? That was, that's what was really important. Appreci I hope everyone has a safe, uh, safe fall and, and those that you are working with in the field are safe. Um, yes, let's go out and spread the word. Thanks everybody.
Absolutely. Yeah, you bet. Thank you.